What's going on, everybody? Eric Lindquist at Stochastic here on the Odd Shopper channel, coming to you with another edition of Lindy's Leans, Likes, and Locks. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and notification bell as we get going. Goes a long way for me over here on this video. Goes a long way for you guys so that you get a prize whenever great betting content is going live at the channel. Uh, let's see. I think, let me, this is happening live. So this is kind of exciting. It is a really close sweat here. I had Milwaukee. I had Milwaukee money line. Game, baby. 90-88. It's the end of that one. It ended up being really, really low scoring. Uh, nothing like a little defense. James Harden looked good again. Embiid looked bad again. That's something to keep in mind. But we got plus money. Over one, plus 150 to get the Milwaukee. Ha <laughs> ha. Holla, my producer, Alicia. Shout out her. She's out there dancing on the other side of the glass because, I don't know, she's excited for me when I win money. That's nice of her. Teamwork makes the dream work, y'all. But thought I would sweat that one live because it was happening right as we went into this. Uh, so good to get one bet across. Hopefully we can get the uh, the Clippers to cover here in the evening session. Go two for two and move into Friday with a little positive momentum. And one thing you can do to guarantee yourself a win, no matter what tomorrow, you head over to BetMGM. You bet $10 on any NHL money line. Yes, that is the name of the game. The NHL, sorry, that's just the way that it has to be. But it's a guaranteed win. So I don't really care whether it's this, NBA, NCAA. If I came up to you on the street and I said, here, give me $10 and I'll give you 200 you would take advantage of that, right? I hope so, or maybe this video is not for you. But simply bet $10 on the NHL money line. You will get $200 when either team in the game scores a goal, and that is going to happen. So take advantage of that offer. Thank you to our friends over at BetMGM. But we've got a massive 11-game slate. I got a lot of info. I got a lot of stats. We have a little bit of a sample size on these. I mean, we're going to overreact a lot. That's kind of the way that this works at the beginning of the season. But gonna be fun i got some winners so leans those are the ones that i'm like eh we'll make some decisions tomorrow if anything shows up of value but not right now a like means yay you can go ahead and bet that one half unit full unit something in that ballpark is generally what i'm looking at for my own personal likes and then a lock means smash it to the moon my friend uh jackie moon shout out that movie because that was fun semi pro good times but either way a lock is the biggest vote of confidence i can give a play that's what we're looking for that's what we want <gasps> all right big intro here to start but we've got a lot to get to let's get to the pick shall we we get our day started with the pelicans facing the hornets and first things first i deserve a lashing here a stern talking to if you will it's just like I'm 12 again. Considering the Pelicans were one of my most bet teams from last season. Yes, I loved them. I loved the Nucleus. Got a lot of covers against the Suns in the playoffs. One of my favorite young cores, no doubt about it. And now they get Zion Williamson, who looked awesome in his debut. And I somehow trusted Ben Simmons as a turning point in my card with the Brooklyn basketball team against this New Orleans team with plus points on the other side or plus money on the money line. Well, fair. There's no excuse. That's, an, that's a mistake. But fear not, one of the beautiful things about having me as your betting tour guide, yes, I like to think of myself as a betting tour guide here, throughout this season, I am more than happy to acknowledge when I'm dead wrong. Just really hope we get this version of Zion the rest of the year because, my God, he's special. And, my God, I'm not going to bet against him very much. Anyways, I say that right from the get-go. I was wrong immediately. And we will take zero away from the Hornets on the other side of this game. Their evisceration of the Spurs against a team that just has made their intentions very clear on opening night. Welcome to Tank Fest 2022, y'all. But the beatdown the Pelicans handed the Nets is definitely something that I am keeping in mind. Now, for what it's worth, if Kelly Oubre is in that starting unit again for the Hornets, I am in love with the over of 16 and a half points. Yes, there were people asking me for props in the comment section below. People want props? I will give you props as we go. Uh, I start putting my cards a little bit together early. You want to get those prop bets in early because the lines, generally, when something pops in my model, I can tell you it's going to be moving in the other direction. So Kelly Oubre, I would expect 17 and a half uh, by the time tip-off comes. So 16 and a half. I like the over of that right now. There you are. A little bonus for y'all. And I had a few of you clamoring for pieces of that card. So there you go. But I am firmly on the Pelican side. I don't care. It's just Pelican season. Dude's a monster, Zion Williamson. Dude looked spry. Dude must be respected after that unreal 25-9-3 performance to go with four steals. Buckle up, NBA. Gonna be a bumpy ride for the rest of you if he looks this good on both ends of the floor like we saw on Wednesday. So I'm just fine laying six or six and a half. That seems like something you could definitely do in this spot. But one bet in particular really stands out to me. And it's the first half 
minus three and a half play currently available at BetMGM. Yes, our friends at BetMGM, I expect some serious regression from this Hornets team after shooting 51% from the field and 45% from three on opening night. You have Zion, Herbert Jones, Brandon Ingram. There's a lot of length and a lot of size for this undermanned LaMelo ballless Hornets team. It's a lot to deal with. So we're starting hot, baby. We're starting heavy. Lock button play on minus three and a half for the first half. Yes, the first half play on the Pelicans. Let's get the positive momentum going early. I can really be my own worst enemy. I apologize to the Pelicans and all of the city of New Orleans for betting against them last time. Promise it won't happen again that much. I'm sure there will be times we bet against them, but not today. Pelicans, get it done in the first half. Oh, speaking of that Spurs team, they're up next, heading into Indiana in a game supporting a hefty 231 total and a mere three-point spread. But as I said before, my God, clearly, Pop, the Spurs, we know what they're up to this season. They are going to be bad. They are going to be horrible. And they are going to be intentionally bad, which kind of makes it worse. I mean, good Lord Almighty, let me just list you off their opening day starters. <clears throat> Trey Jones, Kelton Johnson, Devin Vassell, Jakob Pertl, and Jeremy Sokan. That's one and a quarter NBA starters right there. I'll count Keldon Johnson. He's definitely a serviceable player. And Sokan, I, I do like Trey Jones too, but Sokan, he was a top 10 pick out of Baylor. He can play defense really good. He's a high intensity guy that doesn't hit, get the ball in the basket, but they're pretty awful. They're no good, and they must be punished routinely throughout this season. Still, the Pacers are without Miles Turner, who rolled his ankle when a ball boy slid a ball under his foot on opening night warming up. Because why wouldn't that be a thing that happened? Have a pretty undersized front court as a result, with Jalen Smith and Terry Taylor playing the four and the five in the middle. Terry Taylor is 6'5". Shout out. The most undersized center I've ever seen in the National Basketball Association. So, uh, very solid two-way center in Miles Turner. Going to be missing, about, it sounds like, about a week, week and a half here. That's pretty jarring, and that's why this spread looks jarring, too, because generally, you are going to see the Spurs as massive dogs, and to see them here in this spot just hanging up three makes me a little nervous because I know the public money is going to flood in on the Pacers, and I feel like the line is pretty efficient as a result. Uh, it's not going to budge. I, I just get that feeling. If it does, it might move to, like, two. You could see it maybe move to two at some point in time, but... Look at the front court from Indiana, too. You have Taylor, uh, Jalen Smith, though, aforementioned, if you will, those two. Isaiah Jackson, Goga Patadze played some minutes. I'd rather eat paint than back them as favorites in this spot. Let's call it the Pacers' money line and move our merry way along. We'll just lean that direction. Not going to be a bet that probably makes my card. By far, and I mean by far, the biggest play I made on Wednesday was on minus one and a half Wizards. Then again at minus one, hand it again. And then again, as fast as I humanly possibly could, when we got word that Miles Turner was surprisingly ruled out. And boy, was that a sweat, but it paid off in dividends. It salvaged my night in a lot of ways. Actually gave me a little bit of a profitable night uh, as a result. You want to be reacting to news. That was a huge piece of news. The line moved uh, almost to three there at close, and as it should have, they ended up covering by the skin of our teeth. It was absurd, but... Thanks to them for getting the job done. We move on to a little bit of a tougher tougher task to handicap for this one. They're hosting the Bulls at home for their second game of the season. And is there any way around talking about how good the Bulls looked against a Heat team that couldn't slow down DeRozan, couldn't slow down Vooch on the glass, and couldn't stop a near 100-year-old spry-looking Goran Dragic off the bench? No, I do not think there is enough nice things to say. It was a tight nine-man rotation in the absence of Zach Levine, who's going to be out for this game on Friday as well, so heads up on that. And I liked what I saw from their from their backcourt very, very much from a defensive perspective. They've got pieces like Caruso, Patrick Williams, Io DeSunmo. They can do things on that side of the floor. So overall, I'd be encouraged to be a Bulls fan after that outing. And if Levine can get right, this is an under-the-radar 2022 darling for sure. I do think this, uh, this Washington side is one that I want to be paying close attention to. I just bet them in both Porzingis and Beal. That is definitely going to be a tandem that you want to be backing in spots. But we're looking at Chicago being the dog here. Minus 102, I think that just makes an appropriate straight-up one-unit run-of-the-mill vanilla play. I don't know what else to say. Hey, 
Might just lay by the bay, eat some hay. I just may. What do you say? Shout out Happy Gilmore. Just play this one. Minus 102. We move on. Hey, guys, just a reminder that if you guys want some free money, yes, free money, you can get $200 of it. It's actually $10. That's what it's going to cost you. That's your price of admission to jump over to BetMGM. But once you do, would you like $200 to bet with? Here you go. Play an NHL money line tomorrow. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be minus 400. It could be plus 400. Doesn't matter. When a goal is scored in that game, you're going to get money. $200 of it, in fact. Sign up in the video description box below. You click on that lovely link. It will take you to BetMGM. You will be all taken care of. When you put that first bet into play, has to be an NHL money line. So please do that. Please sign up over there because I want you guys to win money. That's the goal of this program. And this is a great way to guarantee that you can do that tomorrow. We continue on with the NBA picks. Pretty comfortable opening night win for the Hawks on Wednesday. I mean, it got tight there for a little bit. They opened it up, debuted their backcourt piece into Jante Murray. It looked pretty smooth. The two of him, him and Trey Young, I was very concerned about how they might look on the floor together. Think about both of them being ball possession, ball dominant type guards. We've seen multiple times when this just does not pan out for one side of it. But DeJounte Murray's just so damn good all the way around, filling up the box score, doing all the things you were expecting if you were a Hawks fan. And Trey Young has a backcourt, mate. You can be proud of it. It's going to be an enjoyable ride for them. But only nine turnovers for them is really what stood out to me. I love what we saw in terms of Trey Young preventing himself from turning the ball ad nauseum. I think that's going to be one of the big under-the-radar things that's going to be a positive about having DeJounte Murray there. He should be able to just prevent himself from having these massive turnover type games. And that is a massive, massive upgrade for them. They're going to be hosting Orlando here. And I don't think enough can be said about how good Paolo Bancaro looked in his debut. I saw something where he was one of the first rookies in forever to put up 25-5 in their debut since LeBron, I believe. That seems like a good comp to get kind of relayed to. One of my concerns that I talked about was him and Cole Anthony. How are they going to share the ball? Well, Cole Anthony didn't play basketball on Wednesday. That made it easy. He's still sick, apparently. He's questionable for Friday. And this might be a hot take. But I like this Orlando team better playing through Paolo Bancaro than if you have Cole Anthony stealing the ball away from him as a guy who's very much shot first, even though his assist rate was a little bit better than I anticipated going through it. But some of these other pieces on Orlando that they're starting on a nightly basis are just not the kind of guys you want to be backing. Jalen Suggs uh, might have been decent out of Gonzaga. Shout out some of those teams. They were incredible. But not going to be somebody that I want starting on my basketball team routinely in the National Basketball Association. Franz Wagner had a decent enough year last year. Wendell Carter Jr. did exactly what we thought he would do on the interior there. I wish he had put up more points. Only eight shot attempts, five for eight. But that's going to happen. He's going to have these massive spike games. Maybe not necessarily against Clint Capella, John Collins, a Kongwu on the back up there in Atlanta. But still, I do like sometimes backing this Orlando team. I think we're going to be backing them when they get some of these big plus money spots. But Cole Anthony, I kind of prefer to be out. Again, might seem like a little bit of a hot take here. But it definitely sets up for an under of anything here. I think it's a pretty efficient line. I don't think there's enough value to be firing up plus 300 without Cole Anthony, who does have some offensive firepower, I suppose. But again, I'm just higher on this team in general with Paolo Bancaro taking charge of it, maybe not early on in the season. So I'm leaning the under of 222. Talked a lot of fluff about this game, but what it comes down to is I don't think anything is all that important to be betting on an 11-game slate. Better spots, we continue on our merry way. I'm pissed with this team. Here it is. The Brooklyn Nets playing again at home. Damn you, Ben Simmons. What in the world? He looks so good in the preseason. I was so excited to back him. In fact, I put a small little, uh, well, it wasn't a unit. I put a small little uh, half unit play on Ben Simmons to triple double. What a dumb bet. Like legitimately one of the dumber bets ever. It was plus 1500. So uh, in my defense, it was just one of those things where you get that little, you get that itch in the back of your neck and you just kind of, start tweaking we shouldn't do that stuff anymore so we're gonna get away from that no more of that i smoke rocks joe rogan a little bit of that we can't we can't be doing that but i look at toronto going into brooklyn and 
I really do like Scotty Barnes very, very much. And he just reminded me why I love watching him play on both sides of the floor. Pascal Siakam had just a massive opening night, as he will have multiple times, because he's just very, very good at basketball. Chris Boucher remains questionable here for this Friday matchup. I don't think that matters much, because it seems like from time to time they just hate him. And we know Nick Nurse is just going to run that tight rotation that he's ran for the next, last, I don't know, 100 years, it feels like, in Toronto. North of the border, they don't play many guys. But coming south of the border here to Brooklyn, it's weird to call that south of the border, but it is, we're looking at the Nets, and I think they have to play better than what we saw opening night. And this is where it gets to be just overreaction Friday. I know a lot of you are going to be like, Eric, we told you, Pelicans, they're going to beat the Nets. Well, yeah, they did, and they beat them down very, very hard. But we're talking about Kevin Durant. We're talking about, well, I don't want to bring Kyrie Irving and Ben Simmons into it, but we're talking about Kevin Durant. I expect for him to play with pride. I expect for him to put his foot down and say, guys, this is not the way we play basketball. Plus, I do expect Royce O'Neal to continue to be a decent enough piece. I did forget about how bad this bench looks, and it does look abysmal. So I will say that, but... I think Brooklyn wants to start getting off on the right foot. And Steve Nash, I got to imagine he's going to tighten up that rotation, keep it uh, a little bit more time going to Kevin Durant, going to Kyrie Irving, and Ben Simmons. He's going to fill up the box score. Great two-way player. Fits nicely into the complexion of this game against Toronto. Might be leaning in under here. Um, haven't really kind of decided there. My model doesn't really necessarily love it. It's sitting at 224. I don't know if a point and a half is worthy of a bet here. I'll take a, a look again in the morning, and you guys can sign up at stochastic.com slash Lindy and get in that premium Discord using EL Insider. The first week is free. You will know exactly what my card is coming into tomorrow, what my model spits out, but it does like something here, and it's Brooklyn. We're going to lay the two and a half. We're going to lay inside of a three-pointer here on a Brooklyn team in a bounce-back spot against a Toronto team that is just pretty thin themselves. Again, they're going to be playing that OG and Anobi, Scotty Barnes, Fred Van Vliet, Pascal Siakam, and Gary Trent combination. That five is going to see a lot of court time. Precious Achua rotating in, and Chris Boucher, if he's out, just makes it even thinner. I think Brooklyn gets it done. I like their starters straight up against that of the Toronto Raptors. This is going to be appointment viewing, and... Sometimes Miami doesn't necessarily play the most beautiful style of basketball that people want to be tuning into routinely. But when the Celtics come to Miami, when they come to South Beach, and Miami got embarrassed, and it was it was not really as close as what the box score showed. An uh, eight-point loss there to Chicago, but they had no hope of stopping DeRozan. Jimmy Butler running around the floor trying to do his thing there. And I'm worried. Bam Adebayo, everything that we saw out of him could not have been possibly worse. Some of his offensive games started fading towards the end of the playoffs last season as they moved into that deeper series with this same Boston Celtics team. <sighs> I don't know if this is going to be something that I should be hitting the alarm bells, but let me just say, if it were a light on the side of the street, it's it's not red, it's orange-ish. I think that's the combination, right? We're talking red, we're talking yellow, it's somewhere in the middle there. We're, go we're on high alert. We're definitely on an amber alert of sorts here with uh, one Bam out of bio after what we saw against Nikola Vucevic, who he should have been able to dominate in the post. You know who looked pretty good on opening night on Tuesday? That would be the Boston Celtics, who just handed a beat down there to the Sixers. James Harden looked good against them on the perimeter, but uh, also they can close in a number of different ways with Brogdon. They are rotating in a number of different pieces. Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum looked phenomenal in that opening spot. I don't want to go through too many box scores and go through too many numbers because we don't want to be overreacting like crazy. But Boston did look like the favorite to win the East once more if you go off of a one-game sample size. And I don't think anybody can des necessarily dispute with that. But do we want to be backing them as minus 140 favorites on the road? I do not think we want to get in a habit of that. Do we want to be backing them where you're going to be looking at uh, what the money or the, the spread of two and a half here? Not really feeling like laying that either, but I think the under stands out once again to me. Miami, bottom five in terms of possessions last season. They bring the same nucleus of players aside from P.J. Tucker. Talked about that before. And yes, the last game went over that two what was a 218 number that we were looking at. Ended up being 224 points that was put up between them and the Bulls. But I do think these are two teams that are going to run into half, more half-court sets. I don't necessarily think Miami has all the shooters around 
Uh, Tyler Hero is just one man and one man he shall be. But not enough shooting, I think, for this Miami team going up against Boston. Might make it a double and add Boston to the card as a parlay piece with the under of 219, but individually not looking at backing them. So the under of 219 gets the yay, yellow thumbs up. Yay. The force was strong with these two on Wednesday, and boy, am I happy that I bet them both. We have the Detroit Pistons, got that W. We got the New York Knicks, they covered. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Gentlemen, uh, Beautiful stuff. Plus six and a half for New York. They took the Grizzlies to overtime. Oh, that was a thriller and gave me a heart attack because maybe the worst bet or the worst bad beat in sports is when you bet a team at like plus six and a half, they go to overtime. And then they lose by seven. I just felt like that was 100% what was going to happen to me. Was pleasantly surprised as they just lost by three. Anybody who bet the Knicks plus, uh, you know, plus the points there ended up cashing a W. That was beautiful in Detroit. Thank you for what they did there. But you guys asked for props. You said you want props. You need props. So here you go. This is all I'm going to cover in this game because I have no desire to be backing the Pistons as underdogs here. I have no desire to be minus 250 on the Knicks at home. I've seen this episode of television television before. Uh, spoiler alert. It's like an M. Not M. Night Shyamalan. He does movies, but you get the point. I am looking at Bojan Bogdanovic over 17 and a half points. And I don't think I thought this one through enough. This should have been on the card for me. And I'm pretty upset with Wednesday. And it's not just because of what we saw in terms of the box score. He played 29, uh, he played 35 minutes. He was six for 10 from three. He easily went over this number, but he averaged on the on his career 29 minutes per game, averaging over 15 per game. And most of that alongside Donovan Mitchell as ball dominant as it gets. Now, Donovan Mitchell ate up so much usage there in Utah. And you know who isn't going to eat up usage in, in Detroit? Just about anybody. Kate Cunningham is going to be a very serviceable distributor of the basketball going forward. Jaden Ivey might be somebody to be paying attention to as he progresses, but we're talking 34 minutes in a competitive game for Bogdanovich. That's a little bit more than I was expecting for him right out of the gate in game one. 70.6% true shooting percentage. He's one of the best sharpshooters in basketball, and he only had a 21.9% usage rate. If that thing gets north of 25, 26%, which it definitely has plausible uh, reason to be, you're looking at a guy who's going to routinely average around 20, I believe, for this Pistons team. So the minutes allotment is just a lot better than I was expecting. And that makes this play, which is, yes, just minus 110, your standard bet here on Bojan Bogdanovich. It is an absolute smash. It is a lock out of this world. Sadiq Bey is going to have these games where he ends up spiking usage. He only had an 11.2% usage rate. We've seen multiple times, but that's going to be like a 1 in 8, 1 in 10 type game for him. Bogdanovich was acquired to be that veteran presence for this team, and I think he brings it with that perimeter shooting. Get hot, sir, but also you don't even need to get hot. Just go over 17 and a half points. He projects out so well for me. 21.8 points I'm projecting for him in this spot. That makes this an absolute stone-cold second lock of the day. We've got four games to go. We... <laughs> Manamana. Speaking of Memphis, that had no correlation whatsoever, but they are five point favorites here. What? Memphis is only a five point favorite going into Houston? What? What's going on? And here's the thing I get it because the starting lineup for Memphis, uh, not ideal outside of John Morant. Desmond Bain got banged up, but sounds like he's good. Dylan Brooks is probably going to miss again. Aldama played awesome, but I don't expect that long term. So just don't get in a habit of expecting that good of things from him. And John Contra, I mean, this is not going to be your typical type games that we're looking at from these two gentlemen. Uh, a double double from Contra. This is just absurd stuff. Brandon Clark ended up closing that game as he should have. But John Morant going up against this Houston Rockets team that does have some young talent. But I want to highlight and circle one thing Houston played Bruno Fernando over Alperin Sengun. I didn't think this was going to happen, but it surely, surely did. Bruno Fernando started, and whether you want to talk about, hey, well, he started a good enough fantasy game, I do not care. 
If you are trying to win basketball games, you play Alperin Shangun for more than 22 minutes. He's an offensively dominant center. He was phenomenal when he was on the floor, 61.1% effective field goal percentage in that one game sample size. That 33.3% usage rate did all the things on the offensive end you would want him to do, but was limited to 22 minutes because why? Houston is tanking! So here's what it comes down to. I get that it's a road game, and I get that if you don't have Dylan Brooks and Desmond Bain is in any way limited, this is going to be a thin Memphis bench. But... This is a way better Memphis basketball team than this young core and nucleus that Houston is trying to develop. That makes this a no-brainer like. I don't want to lock it. I don't want to go crazy with it. But if I'm building out a parlay card, if I'm looking at anything for Friday's, uh, Friday's tilts, if I'm trying to make a stand somewhere that isn't one of my two locks that I gave you, yes, we are all done with the locks. This is probably third in the pecking order. I do not understand why Houston is only a five-point dog here in this spot. They are actively putting worse basketball players on a floor to actively lose basketball games, and I get it. I would want Victor Wambanyama too. He is unbelievable. He's 7'4". He's French. He's got a cool accent, and he shoots threes. Why wouldn't you want it? But I want the teams facing Houston when it's going to be this kind of a spread this early on. I'm just looking through this rotation. I mean, Jabari Smith, look, you know, whatever. Kevin Porter Jr., he got paid. He's all right, too. Jalen Green, the corpse of Eric Gordon, is still out there playing basketball for 29 minutes a night. Just weird to me. Terry Eason, only 14 minutes for him, too. I am so beyond confused by this Houston rotation that I just have to, out of principle, smash minus five tomorrow. We go to my Minnesota Timberwolves, who disappointed me because they gave me a losing bet and I'm upset, but... You know what? Shea Gilgis Alexander and Josh Giddy played a little bit more than you might have expected for a team that once again is actively trying to tank. But you don't need to even tank to lose to Minnesota. And that brings me to Utah visiting Minnesota. And what's the story here? It's obviously Kelly Olynyk. No, I'm just kidding. It's it's one Rudy Gobert facing off against his old team. And I'm sure he wants to inflict the Stifle Tower defense into every single gourd of every single Utah executive here in this spot. That was an aggressive way of putting it, but you know what I'm saying? I definitely do not expect Utah to do whatever we just saw them do. They shot the lights out of it against Denver. Absolutely shot the lights out of it. Now, Kelly Olynyk was in foul trouble, and that's going to be something that happens a lot when you're facing a Denver front court. We'll get to that here in a second, but... I don't get it. I, I just don't want to be doing anything with this game whatsoever. Eight and a half seems about the appropriate number. 229 for this total. Feels a little bit high, which is why we're going to be leaning the under here. Considering Rudy Gobert defense, we have a larger sample size that needs to be accumulated here. It feels like a high total, but my numbers say that it's about appropriate with the amount of pace that Minnesota played with last season. Whether or not that maintains when Rudy Gobert is playing your five as opposed to Carl Anthony Towns is yet to be determined. I do think the pace overall ends up being a little bit slower than we saw last year, but Anthony Edwards, D'Angelo Russell, they're trying to move the ball up and down the floor. I totally get it. I just don't think I, it's more of a gut thing, which is not something I ever want to get a habit of betting. So I'm steering clear of the atmosphere over Minnesota, of Target Center, of Minneapolis in this one. The under, but not going to be betting, is my lean. Two games left here on the card, and we've got a good one here. Denver is in need of redemption after an absolute egg that they laid in Utah. They're probably a dragon now by now. House of Dragons, shout out. It's been enjoyable. Kind of. I don't know. A lot of cousin love and stuff, but probably get away from talking about that now let's talk some basketball shall we golden state looked pretty good against the lakers but a lot of teams are going to look good against the lakers fingers crossed one of them is the clippers give me crap in the comment section below in case uh my my double ticket there my parlay does not come to fruition and the clippers somehow lose to the lakers that would hurt my heart but i definitely think this is kind of a, all systems go here on a parlay piece now Minus 210 here for Golden State, that might not seem like value, but I have this as a fair value being closer to minus 230 on Ot Chopper. Looks like it's a decent enough value piece. No negative uh, ROI that we're looking at over there right now with that kind of a number. And that's where it just becomes intriguing to look at this Golden State team that is just deep. And there were reports that Steve Kerr was going to limit his starters to under 30 minutes. Well, that didn't happen. He's a damn dirty liar like a lot of coaches. But Steph Curry, Andrew Wiggins, Clay Thompson, Jordan Poole, Draymond Green, 
James Wiseman, Kavon Looney, Dante DiVincenzo, and then out of the middle of nowhere, nowhere, a serviceable J. Michael Green. We're talking about one of the deepest benches, not even to mention Jonathan Kaminga, who played like absolute dog doo-doo. Moses Moody is going to be fantastic for this basketball team too. It's an embarrassment of riches, especially when you have his premier shooting is what they've got on the perimeter. Now, all of that being said, I'm going to be paying very close attention to the Jamal Murray injury. Now, he just got done having basically a year and a half, a year and a half off of basketball for a multitude of injuries. Then he had a hamstring injury in the preseason, and then he turns his ankle here in the first game of the season. I got to imagine if you're Denver, you do not want Jamal Murray having any kind of an, in an issue with this injury. Now, it's a left knee injury management is what they're calling this. I'm expecting him to not play, which is why I want to get this bet in now. There is no Monty Morris. There's no Will Barton backing them up in Denver anymore, which just makes this a very thin spot. Not to mention Facundo Campazzo. What a wonderful phrase. He's not there either. Want to let you guys all know that this is a very different Denver bench than what we've had before. You got Bruce Brown coming off of it, Bones Highland. That is not your typical crew. And if one of them is thrust into the starting lineup, Boy, does Steph Curry and Clay Thompson look really, really good here. So pretty straightforward like play on that money line. I don't think I want to be hanging up the five and a half here. I could see this game being a little bit more com competitive with most, but this is definitely getting paired with our last game of the night. Let's get to it now. Boom. Look at that. Producer. God, producer Alicia just crushing the game. Give her some love in the comment section below. Actually, don't stay out of her life. Uh, we've got the Suns. We've got the Portland Trail Blazers finishing it off here. And uh, the Suns come from behind mode. Pretty impressive against the Mavs there. I enjoyed watching that brand of basketball. Devin Booker back to doing his thing. Chris Paul. We'll see if this millionth season of basketball has some wear and tear on him. But 28 points there. 10 of 20 shooting for Devin Booker. Uh, perfect at the line. Perfect from three. Everything looked good. He played 41 minutes. They had to make a statement there. The Mavs got off to a hot start. And I think they just said, Devin Booker, go win us a basketball game. And guess what he can do? He can win you basketball games. And when you compare this Phoenix roster to the roster of the Portland Trailblazers on the other side, who had a come from behind game of their own right, I'm worried because Yusuf Nurkic got benched at halftime. And that is a piece that they definitely need to be working on the interior. Now, they can go to some small ball lineups, but not against DeAndre Ayton. You do not want to get in the habit of that. Uh, you could definitely play small ball lineups against Jack Landale and those individuals, but feeling all right about this Phoenix Suns team going forward here. I I was very, very low on them last year uh, for the playoffs. Shorted them every opportunity I could with the Pelicans. Shorted them again with the Mavericks. That worked out very well as the Mavericks uh, clinched that series in seven. I'm looking, though as an improved situation here with Phoenix, mainly because of Devin Booker and Damian Lee. What a shot. What a moment for him. I don't know if that's going to be long-term, but this Portland team, not all that high on them throughout this season, nor should anybody be. Anthony Simons, if he can continue to develop, that can be their new CJ McCollum. He's kind of CJ McCollum light to me, but I think Phoenix is an easy money line addition to the Golden State play. So there you go. Kind of put using them in conjunction. I know that that might be cheating a little bit, but I want to get to this Phoenix money line. I also want to pair it with Golden State. Should give you some plus money on that one. Feel pretty confident that that ticket can get us home, finish your night off right, and head into the weekend with a little extra change in your pocket. I promise I'm done singing. And that does it for another edition of Lindy's Leans, Likes, and Locks. You know what to do. Head to that comment section below. Give me some shit. I love it. Bring it, baby. Uh, very excited about this card. Very excited about all the work we're doing over here at the Odd Shopper channel. So if you're joining us for the first time, hope you enjoyed this. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and notification bell. And I will be back here next week, starting on Monday. Uh, I'm obviously focused in the MLB street all the way through. We've got Lindy's Leans, Likes, and Locks for that all the way through the World Series. Looking forward to giving you guys the information there. But... If you guys have not yet signed up at BetMGM, don't forget to do that on your way out. You simply bet $10 on any NHL money line, and no matter what, you're going to get 200 bucks because a team is going to score a goal in that game. That does it for me on the week. Enjoy Aton Shander starting on Saturday. Until then, I'm Eric Lindquist. Best of luck in the NBA streets on Friday.